the Apostle Paul, by the power of the Holy Spirit, has set it up, right? He said, this is who you are in Christ. You were dead, and Christ has made you alive by his grace. And it's through your faith, believing his promises, that now you are created in Christ Jesus to do good works in advance, right? How do we do that, though? Where do we start? Do I just run down to Branson Landing and help the little old ladies across the street, whether they want me to or not? You know, that's, I mean, what do we do? And it's really interesting because he's going to kind of express this again through God's word, beginning in verse 11, chapter 2, verse 11, these words. Therefore, in other words, remember, you've been saved by grace through faith and created to do good works. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth, that means outsiders, those who didn't grow up in the, in the Old Testament church, the people of Israel, and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision. Now that's a key thing there because he's saying, he's saying you were on the outside, right? And you didn't have all the right things. You didn't do the right religious stuff, right? That was done in the body by the hands of men. Verse 12, remember that at the same time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of, prom- of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the what? The blood of Christ. That's right. For He Himself is our peace. Who made the two, that is the two people, the insiders and the outsiders, one, and destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. And I want to pause right there because he's actually using an image that the religious people, the Jewish people, the people who had grown up with all this stuff would have understood. And that is when you went to the temple, right, there was a wall that separated the Gentiles from the Jews. And the Gentiles, so most, I think most of all of us, except for Lair, are Gentiles, right? And so, and so unless there's something you guys need to tell me. And so you, we, what we do is we couldn't go in to be in God's presence. We would have to be on the outside, and only those born of Abraham could go on the inside. And, and Paul's like, Jesus tore that wall down. He tore that wall down. Look at verse 15. He did it by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man, a new Adam, a new humanity, out of the two, thus making peace. Now guys, you've got to remember, peace is not just absence of conflict, but it's restoration of all things. That's shalom in the original Hebrew, which is what Paul would have been thinking of as he wrote this word in Greek, hey, Rene. And in this one body, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. So it's for everyone. For through him we have both, we, we have, excuse me, we both, that is both the insiders and the outsiders, have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. This is why all of the Old Testament promises flow into our lives as well. We're no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. Verse 20, built on the foundation of the apostles, think New Testament, and prophets, think Old Testament, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building, notice we're talking about buildings again, is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And just so we're on track together, what's the building there? It's the people. And Jesus himself is the cornerstone. Verse 22, And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. He continues, For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. And I'm sorry, I lost my place. There we go. Verse 3, that is, the mystery made known to me by revelation as I have already written briefly. In reading this then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which which was not made known to men in other generations as it has been now revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. The mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and shares together in the promise in Christ Jesus. Verse 7, 
I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me, though I am less than all, the least of all God's people, the grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. Now guys, verse 10 is a big deal. Verse 10, he's really kind of, he's going to explain it in detail. His intent was that now through the what? Yeah. Through the church, the manifold wisdom of God, which means many facets, many sided, many faceted wisdom of God, should be made known to the rulers and authorities in, in the heavenly realms. He's talking about the bad guys, the demons, the devils, all, the, all those which thwart everything humans do. That is what is going to be revealed, and for which ages past was kept hidden in God and who created all things. Now, I skipped it. I'm losing my place like crazy this morning. Something's going on with my eyes. Verse 11. According to his eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. So it was always this way. This was always the plan. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with fear and trepidation. Oh, wait, it doesn't say that, does it? In him and through faith in him, we may, may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are for your glory. We continue in verse 14. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of the glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and how high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure with all the fullness of God. Now to Him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to His power that is at work within us, to Him be the glory in the church and in Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. You might be sitting there going, wow, they really like to read long scriptures here. And I understand that. But th there's so much here that we need to see because it, it, it's, it filters right into this idea of the bride. right? This, this whole topic that we're going to talk about, the bride of Christ. And I'm looking at the bride of Christ. Right? We are the bride of Christ. This is what this promise is teaching us. But there's so many specific things that impact your life and mine that we need to open up and look at. And that's what we're going to do as we ask the question, how do we participate in God's plan to restore all things? So with that, please join me as we pray and ask the Lord to be with us as we study. Father, we thank you for all that you give us. And we ask you right now to be with us as we study these powerful promises. I pray that you'd give us a special measure of your spirit and your wisdom and your, your whole heart toward these things, these ideas, because it's your heart that we're seeking this morning, this idea that you love the bride, that you have done all that you've done for the bride. And I pray that you would cast out the evil one, the powers and the principalities, as Paul wrote, and I pray that you would instead fill this place with your spirit and your peace. Lord, pour out your grace and your mercy as well as we seek your face through your word, in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, this idea, this question of the bride, it, it, it really immediately gets going because, um, have you ever heard the phrase, I don't go to church because, dot, dot, dot. Someone will say, I, I'm not into church. Church is like, church has got icky stuff in it. I don't go there, right? And um, it's really interesting, and when I was in seminary um, some years ago, we, I went to a, I was, you get assigned to field work congregations, right? And so we went to this church, and they had these t-shirts, these they were like, don't go to church, be the church. And I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. It's a catchy phrase, but what's interesting is, is, is it's kind of hard to be something you already are, right? In other words, we are the church. It's, it, that's who we are. And so it's like our base identity, it's our starting point, we are the bride of Jesus. 
And what's really interesting, and I think harder for us, it certainly is for me. Now, you guys might be like, Mark, that's your problem. We, get, we got this handled. But for me, I have always struggled with this idea because I never liked church. I don't know if I'm the only one, right? And I sh- we've been sharing this as we've been going through our basic beliefs through these things. And, and the reason I didn't like it is because I didn't understand it. I didn't un- I didn't, but the main reason I didn't like it is I felt like it was some sort of a manufactured game, right? Right? You go here, you become, or maybe you go here because you're good, right? And then, and then you like hang out and you f- you're like, yeah, I am good. And you're like, yeah, I'm really good. And then you go out and then none of, nothing matters, right? And this becomes the challenge. And this is what we want to avoid as we learn about what this is. Because if we think church is all about just stuff that we do on Sunday morning, then we've missed everything that was just talked about there. What are some of the questions? Everybody has questions and we've been each week in our Savior Silhouettes, as we look at Anthony's artwork and God's Word, we've been asking these, what are everyone's questions? And we, we've, we've put these up here on the screen. And, you know, the first one is, do I need to go to church to be saved? So, yeah, right. <laughs> so, so, you know, this is silly. But it, it, what it is, is it's a category mistake. It's what we call a category mistake. It's like saying the color blue tastes good. You know, you're just like, what are you talking about, right? Um, now, you, there's certain things that are blue that might taste good. I don't know. But... Um, this is, if we are the church, then going to church is not what we're talking about. Can I, can't I just worship God anywhere? Well, of course we can, right? But the question is, what is worship, right? What do we mean by that? Most of the time we mean this, right? I go, I sing some songs, you know, and maybe I do a specific liturgy or a different liturgy or whatever, and I, whatever it might be, and, and this is what I do, and then if I do those things, I have worshiped. And I want you to, I want, we're going to explore what the Bible says about what worship is. And then isn't the church filled with hypocrites? And of course, we're like, well, like, yeah, right? <laughs> I mean, of course it is. But again, hypocrisy is something that's very interesting because it's a lot of times what we think hypocrisy means is that so, so if I go out and I party on Saturday night and then I come to worship on Sunday morning, then oh, you're a hypocrite, right? That's, that's the way it is. But actually, the Bible only speaks about hypocrisy five times. And in all five of those cases, it's very specific that the the people who go out and party on Saturday night aren't the hypocrites. It's the ones who are waiting for them when they get here on Sunday morning and say to them, oh, what are you doing here? Those are the hypocrites, right? So so yes, of course the church is filled with hypocrites. And there's uh, there's a book that came out some years ago, and I forget the author's name. I have a mental block. It flies out of my mind. Um, But it's called You Lost Me. And and the the book is basically the, the authors went out and asked young people ages 18 to 24, um, and that, that's been about seven years ago, so now they'd be a little older, but that was at the time, why aren't, why aren't you going to church? And they were like, because people at church are judgmental. Yeah, it's very interesting. So let's dive into this. Let's see where we go. Ephesians chapter 1. So we'll see, we're gonna, eventually we're going to get all of Ephesians in here today. Chapter 1, verses 22, 23. We're going to put these on the screen so we can zoom in on them a little bit. Because the first word we have to define is what is the church, Right? And it says here, Paul again writing by the Spirit, he says, And God placed all things under the feet of Jesus and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. Okay. Now keep in mind, just to pause right there, that when these were written, these words were written in the 50s of the first century, um, there would not be a church building for nearly 200 plus years, okay? Um, and, so, and so it's very important to note is that in our language, church can mean lots of different things. It can mean a building, it can mean a worship service, it can mean um, all kinds of other things that I'm, I'm sure we would think of, and then, the, and then, of course, it also means God's people. Here and in the Scripture, it always talks about God's people. So he is the head of the church, which is his body, right? The fullness of him. Now see, that's an interesting way of thinking. The fullness of Jesus. Do we often think about the fullness of Jesus being present here or anywhere that we go, right? This is, this is not what we think about. It's not what I grew up thinking about. Um, I grew up thinking about that the church is a dark, dreary place that sounds like a funeral every Sunday. That's what I grew up thinking, and I was wrong about that. You need to know I was wrong about that. But what's more important is that we see the fullness of Christ in in his people, and he fills everything in any way. And what we're going to see is he does it through us. And that's the mystery that's going to blow our minds. But how does he do it? Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. We read these verses, but it's important that we we lock these in. Because, guys, um, 
who is welcome in the church? Everyone. Yeah, everyone, exactly. Everyone is welcome. Um, Matt Chandler had a famous sermon. He's a pastor down in Texas from a different faith tradition, but it, it captures this passage really well. And he tells the story about how he and his buddy went to this youth rally, and they, had, they went there because his friend was playing in the band. And so and after they played, they took an intermission, and this preacher comes out, right? And he's got this beautiful rose in his hand. And he sniffs the rose, and he's like, isn't this beautiful? And he kind of feels the petals. You know, you've got to watch the thorns, but he's, it's beautiful. And so, and so he says, what do you guys think? And he tosses it out in the crowd, and he says, here, check it out. Feel the rose. See what you think about it. And he's going around, and he proceeds to then preach a sermon about sex and about how bad it is, right? There's that, that classic fire and brimstone, don't have sex outside of marriage, right? And then all after a while, that rose makes its way back. And he says, here, give me my rose. Where's my rose? And he, and he gets the rose, and it's like bent, and it's, the petals are broken, and one of them's fallen off, and it's just this rose is terrible. And this was his crescendo of his sex sermon. He goes, who wants this now? And Matt was sitting there in the, in the, uh, in the crowd, and he almost comes out of his chair because he's thinking about this. And he says, Jesus wants the rose. Do you guys track with me? Do you see what, you see what happened there? We go through this life and we get messed up, jacked up, whatever you want to call it. it. We look like that. And some of us, yeah, whatever. Our past, our history, we can talk about that. We can compare notes. And it turns out if we started comparing sins, we're all going to have plenty to compare, right? But that's why Jesus came. That's exactly why he came. And it is, for by, it is by grace that we have been saved, not by our works. And it is through our faith. And how does this work? These words are proclaimed to you and me. We hear the words, we see the words, and something happens through the God's Spirit that gives us the ability to believe the words. It is a gift from God. It is not from ourselves. It is not by our works so that no one can boast. This is the baseline. This is the foundation of the church. And, and it... And it's why, we, it's why to this day we have denominations of churches, right? Because there was this time when there was only one church, right? And it was the universal church, which the Latin word for that is Catholic, right? And so, and so now we think of Catholic as just a denomination, but it, 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 it was supposed to only be one holy church, right? That was the idea. And, but they had just taken this and sort of put it somewhere where they weren't using it anymore, at least some of them. And during that time, all this corruption and stuff led into this. And guys, here's the thing. It wasn't just them that did that. Everywhere there's human beings, we keep doing it, right? And we do it. And, and it's funny, I, I, I would love to stand here and say, praise and worship never does that. I would, I would love to say that. But we struggle with it too because what will happen, and I'm only speaking for myself here, so just so we're all clear, I'm speaking for myself. What will happen is we will look down our nose at somebody and they're not as good as we are. I don't know if that ever happens to you because it does to me and I wish I could say that it doesn't. But how does this work and how does this play out? Look at Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Now, we're picking up a companion text here, but it's the same topic. And it's like, what is the church and how does it work? He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters. Now, he says, in view of God's mercy, he's talking about Romans chapters 1 through 11, right? About the mercy and grace of God, which are just as clear as what we saw on the screen. And he says, in view of that, in view of his love and grace for you and for me, now offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. So what's interesting is we often think of, and, and we use the words, I use the words, hey, it's great to worship with you this morning. I said that to several people today. And so worship does include what we're doing here, but it's not only this. Okay? Worship is 24-7 all the time. right? And it's specifically when we choose to worship, when we're like saying, Lord, I... I submit to you and I want to love my neighbor. I want to, my boss just chewed me out and I want to knock his or her teeth out, but I'm going to not like pursue that emotion. Instead, I'm going to ask you to forgive me for feeling that way and I'm going to try to seek reconciliation or this bully at school or, you know, on we can make the list, right? The people in our lives that, that just, you know, they do that to our innards and we don't like it. And when we respond with God's love instead of our natural hatred or our, our, our default position, which would be to grit our, grit our teeth and shake our fist, that is worship, guys. That is worship. Even those times when we do it anyway, when we do shake our fist and we do cuss out that person that cut us off in traffic and we do do that, 
And then we're like, Lord, I'm sorry. I didn't, I, I lost my temper, right? That's worship. When you are out in your garden and you think, oh my gosh, those weeds. <laughs> and you're, you know, and you're, but you, you clear the weeds and you keep working the ground, that's worship. When you're at your job, right? And you're thinking, Mark, you haven't seen my job. It's a dirty job. And you're doing your job. You know, Uncle Marty called it our vocation, right? And it's this idea of whatever we're doing, whenever, whenever, when, when you're changing diapers and you're a mom or a grandma, you're, these are acts of worship, right? We don't often think that way, but the scriptures are teaching us to think that way. And yes, certainly this is worship as well. But guys, what's interesting is the orientation is probably the opposite of what we would think. In the olden days, in the back in the German days, uh, you know, with, with Uncle Marty and his crew, they would call what we're doing the, and I'm not going to say this right, so German speakers forgive me, Gottendeist. And I'm, I'm pretty sure I just butchered that. But Gottendeist means, means God serves us, right? And so they called it. Now, what was interesting, I, I grew up hearing the phrase divine service. And I'm like, oh, that's where you got to do everything just right so that God will love you, right? That's what I grew up thinking it meant. That's not, that's not what it meant at all. It meant that God comes here and he says, I love you. And we come here to receive that. Do you track with me? I mean, when we eat and drink the mercy and grace of God, that's what's going on. He is coming to help you and me be able to do this, right? That's what it's all about. Take a look at Ephesians 6.12, because why? Why is it this way? And the answer is for our struggle See, I told you we're going to get all of Ephesians in here one way or the other. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. I want to pause right there. Because we often live our lives as though it is, don't we? My problem is not my problem, it's my wife's problem. It's my kid's problem. It's my boss's problem. It's that person down the street's problem. It's the neighbor, you know, it's that guy who cut me off in traffic. Whoever, it's their fault. And what we have when we're blaming everyone... Or maybe some of, us will, some of us won't blame everyone. We'll just say, I am, I'm terrible. I am a failure. Right? Sometimes we turn it all this way. Either way, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Who is it against? The rulers, the authorities, the powers of this dark world, the spiritual forces of evil. Now, when, around here, when, when, when President Obama was in office and we would say rulers, they'd be like, yep, that's him. But now they can't do that because they like Trump. So, or vice versa. Maybe you're the other way around. And so, see, it doesn't work that way. This is not politics. This is not politics. This is, this, is, this is the war of the universe, right? And when we talk about rulers and authorities and powers of this dark world, the spiritual forces of evil, we're talking about demonic forces that we can't see, and I'm pretty sure it's a good thing we couldn't because I think if we could actually see what's going on, we'd just run in our rooms and hide. That's what we would do. And so, and so that's okay. We're blind to that, but this is why we gather here. So God comes to us, he protects us, and we stand in protest. That's why we stand when we sing songs. We are participating in the kingdom of God because wherever the king is, that's where the kingdom is. You, you're tracking with me. And this is what's going on right here in this passage, what he's saying. You know, the real enemy, the real enemy is not one another, even though we feel like that is what's going on. The real enemy is trying to convince us that it's one another. And that takes away the love of Christ from our ability to, you know, it takes it away because we believe the lie, right? Now, there was, a, there was a, a movie out a few years ago called War Room. And they, in the story, there's lots of stuff in that movie that you may love or not love, but either way, I love this one part. And it, there was the um, older gal, Clara, and she was teaching the friend who was having struggle with her marriage, right? And this gal in her marriage was saying, you know, I've had it with him. He's, he doesn't get it. He doesn't know how to be a husband, and so we're done. And then Clara would say, it's, he, he's not your enemy. There is an enemy, but it ain't him. And then through the course of the movie, she disciples this person to pray, to read scripture, to study the Lord, what the Lord would say about all this. And then after a while, there was this time when the wife forgave the husband. And then my favorite line in the movie, Clara comes up and she gets off the phone when she hears that. And she goes, ooh, devil, you done got your butt kicked, right? You know, which is, you know. You're like, that's not very religious. I would argue it's extremely uh, in, in the light of Christ because that's what's going on here, right? That's what's going on here. Ephesians 3, verse 10, because this is why we are church. This is exactly why we're a church. His intent, God's intent, was that now, through the church, 
The many-sided or manifold, I didn't know, manifold, I always thought that was a thing on your car, but it turns out it has many little things that come out, right? That's why it's called a manifold. The manifold wisdom, the many-sided wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly realms. Now, I don't know if you're catching that, if you're tracking with me on this, but God's plan is that the protest against the darkness, against the kingdom of evil, against the powers and the principalities is supposed to happen through you and through me here and everywhere we go. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that something that would just be like, that isn't what I expected? I certainly didn't grow up thinking church had anything to do with that. Because what I knew is we get up and we always did the exact same thing every Sunday. I don't know if you guys notice, but we do too, pretty much. We'll change, we'll change a few things. We did, we did an antiphon today. That was different. But it doesn't matter. You can go to any church. They're going to do pretty much the same thing. It just, it's just a, your preference of which things. And so the issue is not like, like I remember when I was, Growing up, then I thought, I thought, well, what I need to do is I need to go to a contemporary church because then that'll be different. But then I found that that isn't really the case. I might like the music better, and I do, but that isn't the solution. That isn't the problem. The problem was my own heart in rejecting what God was doing and the reality that the evil one had convinced me that that church was a waste of time, which is what an entire generation has grown up thinking in our midst which is means we got work to do. Take a look at Ephesians 3.11. How, what is the power? Where does this come from? It's according to his eternal purpose, God's eternal purpose, which he has accomplished. It is a past tense. It is done in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, you and I, yes, of course there are hypocrites in church. We're all here, right? We, and we all look down our noses between, it may not, maybe I didn't do it today, but I might do it tomorrow, right? And so we all struggle with that. But, you know, we could either be in here or out jogging with all the perfect people, like Rich Mullins would always say. And the answer is, of course, we're all, all humans have the same disease, the brokenness of sin. And Jesus has come to solve that disease, to cure it with his blood. Right? And that's exactly what it does. Then what happens is His Spirit comes into our bodies. Because remember what He said, in Christ is the church, the fullness of His presence. Take a look at Ephesians 3.12. Because this changes it all the way around. In Him and through faith in Him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. See, when we start to believe this stuff, then what happens is some Yehu who never understood church growing up reads and studies all like, that's why they sang the Kyrie every Sunday for 900 million years? I didn't know that. Oh, that's pretty cool. You know, that's why, insert, that church practice was done, and we never even knew why. So the, the problem is not, is not that church is bad. The problem is we got to get back to work. We can't have the church on cruise control, right? This needs to be preached from the mountaintops. We need to all participate in, the, in God's plan to restore all things, to share the love of Christ. Take a look at Ephesians 5, 25 and 26. Now this, you're going to be like, now Mark, yeah, I know you want to do all of Ephesians, but what's this all about? Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. You want to do church? You want to be church? Go home and love your wife. Wives, love your husbands. Single people, love your siblings, right? Love your neighbors, right? Ever, love the people, love the one you're with. That was a great song, right? But it's true, right? Whoever is in your life, love them. But it starts with husbands. It just does. Because then the kids who aren't married yet, or even the single young adults, whatever it might, when they see the dad do this, it impacts them. It shows them what church actually is. And I know you're, you're thinking, Mike, that ain't church. That's just like, how do I live my life? Yeah, that's called church. That's called worship, right? And so what happens is, is, he says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Now, guess what? Was it fair for Jesus to be on the cross? Mm-mm. No, he was the only righteous and innocent man ever to live on this earth. And what was he saying as they were nailing him to the wood beams? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing, right? You see, you see, this is how husbands are to love their wives. Because if husbands love their wives like this, and you're, you're sitting there going, but that ain't fair. I took the trash out three times, and now she wants me to also do the dishes. That ain't fair, right? And meanwhile, the wife was like, dude, you ain't seen unfair yet, right? And, and see, see, this is what happens. 
And so I'm using a silly example, but we all know it gets much worse, right? And, and, and the way we think about what each other thinks and feels and all of that sort of thing. This is church. This is what church does. This is how it works. Take a look at verses 26 and 27 and see what's interesting is Jesus then did something that, was, that we don't expect. He cleansed his bride, washing with the water through the word. This is why we gather on Sunday. We need to be washed again, right? We come, we remember our baptisms, we, we hear the gospel again, and it gives us power by the Holy Spirit because it's God's word and it does stuff. And it washes us, it makes us holy. And to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. See, if a husband starts to think for one minute that it's his responsibility to help his wife be who she's supposed to be, you know what will happen? Well, peace and goodwill toward men. Right? I mean, this is what happens, right? And see, it just changes everything. The kid's in the house, and you might be thinking, guys, I'm single. This doesn't apply to me. It it's absolutely does. Because this is God's plan to restore all things. So the wives are sitting here going, I'm liking this sermon. This is going good. And, and so, but I'm ser- but what, you know, I didn't put it on the screen because I'm trying to limit my Ephesians text, but there's this passage right in there that says, so now wives, respect your husbands, Right? Submit to them, right? And, and, and we, in our culture, we're like, what? that's misogynistic, you know, yucky stuff, right? And, and, and no, it's not misogynistic because if the husbands are dying for their wives, there's no misogyny there. Somebody's back there going, misogyny, what's that word? Anyway, so the idea is that we trust in Christ and we put our faith in Him and we are church. I mean, this is interesting. The gospel sets us free, gives us freedom and confidence. What do we do with that? We love one another. We help one another. And you know what that will do? You know what that will do? It'll start to restore our home and our neighborhood and our town and our county and our state and our country and our world. Can we pray about that? Let's pray. Father, I ask you boldly to be with us right now and help us understand and grow in your definitions of church of worship, of all of the things that those words mean and the baggage that they carry with them. And I pray boldly, Lord, that you would help us trust in you for all of these things. I pray boldly, Lord, that you would help us see one another with new eyes, that we'd recognize that one another aren't the enemies, but that it's the powers of the dark forces that are the enemies, and that each other even those people we wouldn't have voted for are the people you've called us to love. The people you've called us to submit to, to participate in making all things right. Lord, I pray that you'd help us think in concentric circles. I can't save the world, but man, what could I do in my house? What could I do at my workplace? What could I do in my school? What could I do down at the lake when I'm playing and having fun? What can I do to do church, to worship, to be the spiritual sacrifice that we read about today? But Lord, never, ever let us put that on our shoulders as some sort of burden that we have to do to earn your love. We can only do it because you have set us free. So help us seek your face every morning, receiving the good news that we are saved by grace through faith every day. And we approach you with freedom and confidence. And then we go love our neighbor. And when we fall down, we hear the words again, saved by grace, through faith. We approach you with freedom and confidence. And then we go love our neighbor. And then we fall down. And then we keep on doing this. Not by our power, not by our strength, but by the almighty name of Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. For more information and for more audio and video content, visit www.branson.church.